anybody needs that YouTube link, it's at the uh, the very bottom of the email blast that I send out for Taxonomy Tuesday. It's a little YouTube icon. It's very small, but it is there. If you click on that, it will take you to a library full of recordings of the past Taxonomy Tuesday things. Um, so um, Nina asked if we could do foliotis because uh, she said that she did not know much about foliotis. And um, I found that I am pretty much the same way too. I really don't know much about them myself there. I find them very difficult to uh, identify in the field. And I was reading a little bit about them earlier today. And uh, Michael Quo from Mushroom Expert, he says that they are, he agrees that they're very difficult to uh, identify to a uh, species without using microscopy. Um, but this, this definition here is taken from Wikipedia. Um, I literally copy and pasted it out of Wikipedia. So they define the genus Foliota as including mushrooms with scaly glutinous caps to dry cap surfaces. They frequently grow on wood or at the base of trees or on decaying tree roots. They have spores that are brown, light brown, yellowish brown. Um, the spores are smooth with a germ pore, um, although the germ pore can be quite narrow in species. Um, so a germ pore is the little, I think the little uh, on the end, you can see like a little divot in the end. Is that correct? Am I saying that correctly? Anybody want to confirm that? Dave, is Dave there? Yeah, I'm sorry. Which, which word? Uh, germ, germ pore. When you're germ saying... pore. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's the way. That's the way I say it when I read it. I think those sounds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, the like. So specifically, though, that's the little divot on the end of yeah. the spore where it yeah. would actually germinate from. Yeah, it's like a little opening. Yes. Okay. But may I ask something? Does, is it mm, on the part that is attached to the basidia or at the other end? I believe it's the other end. Oh, okay. Okay. So Wikipedia also says usually species have pleurocystidia which include a type that are called chrysocystidia. So I had to look up what chrysocystidia meant. And those are cystidia whose contents contain a distinct refractive yellow body that becomes more deeply yellow when exposed to ammonia or other alkaline compounds. That's May I ask? You can ask. <laughs> Dave, um, is this, but is there chrysocystidia on other kind of uh, fungi? Uh, I mean, mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, I the, have seen them in other ones. Yeah, the, the, the fairly large wood inhabiting hypholoma species like capnoides, <coughs> excuse me, and I think probably um, Laterideum have um, chrysocystidia. But I just learned something because I didn't know that this was something you look for in foliota. I had read that um, chrysocystidia are common throughout things in Strepharyaceae. Ah, uh, okay. So I should be mounting gill material, uh, at least maybe switch on and off uh, from my usual Congo red that I use because it highlights features pretty well. Uh, but I should also use KOH, which is alkaline, and then the chrysostostidia are going to show up because it'll they'll turn yellow. So, you know, learn something new. That's good. Mm -hmm. So I looked up in Outline of Fungi, that's the website that I go to to look at uh, this type of stuff sometimes. So Strepharyaceae, um, that's the family. So all of these things are in there, like the hypholoma that you were just speaking about, which the price is cystidia. Um, so Foliota, right now the current count is, they're estimated to be 157 species worldwide, according to this website. Just supposed to be fairly well, fairly accurate. But we can see some of the other things that are very closely related to foliota in here, like a grassy bee, just something we see often. Bogbodia, we see that in the pine barren sometimes. I don't know what that one is, but Taconica, um, Hypholoma, which David just mentioned. And you guys can see the other ones that are on here. Um, so, uh, look. Yes. So, are you saying that all these? other genus belong 
to, all these belong to the Estropariaceae, so they are related to foliopas. That is correct. Okay. okay. Yep. Everything in this list here are closely related, you know, cousin, cousins, if you will, you know, um, <sighs> to foliota. Oh man, I wish we knew that before. <laughs> Why? Because I, I only have just foliotas to show and then foliotina and and then um, flammulaster. Yeah, you know, it I didn't belong in there. I don't right. see it. You're right. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I didn't yeah. even do anything to share because I really don't have any foliota, but I guess we could okay. have looked at any of these other ones too. Okay. Um, anyway, um nice. I'm going to so I will stop sharing for a second and then I'm gonna go back in. Are you guys seeing my inbox? The same, the estrofaria se hace right, family. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it looks like, Marisol, you're the first one to email me, so. Oh my goodness. So you get to, you get to break the ice. <laughs> yes, and I tell you, I have no idea. I only have these photos and I didn't do my of I, I think maybe I make micro of one, but, and, okay. So the first one is called Foliota Auribella, but I will never know unless the next time I find it, I'll work on its micro because there is another species that is close to this one. Um, it's on the, on the comments down there. And the difference between these two species is in the size of the spores. Oh, yeah. Limonella. Or limonella. So it could also be limonella. So the size of the spores defines which species, but I can't tell right now, but in the future, so I know what to do. Get some spore print and then measure the spores. That's exactly what I just read on Mushroom Expert, <laughs> what yeah. you just said. The only way to tell the difference between these two species are by the spores. Mm -hmm. All right. I posted two uh, observations of this foliota um, granulosa um, because I think that is the right um, name. And it has it's a very small. Um, fungus it grows on rotten the rotten deciduous wood and is is very handsome it has scales on the cap as you can see and on the stem and i think that i did the micro for this one so the sport yeah yes yeah, some some texture on the on the stem I think the spores, you can see the size in there. I think that the spore print it has to be dark because the spores are kind of between yellow and brown and light brown. Here I, I use Congo red, so, but I, I can tell that the spores are dark. And here, this is a Calocystidia and 100 magnification. You see that is very abundant. I am not sure that in some mushrooms um, there is no basidia on the edge of the gill. Did you know that, Dave? Yeah, the the mushrooms that have um, the are the gill edges crowded with okay. chylocystidia, um, they are often referred to as having a sterile edge um, oh. because it's all chylocystidia, which of course are don't bear spores, they're sterile. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, the ones wow. that, that are loaded with chylocystidia on the edges of the gills um, often have no basidia on the edges of the gills. Mm -hmm. As you can see, thank you, Dave. As you can see on this photo, this is loaded with uh, chylocystidia, which is the name for the cystidia that is um, like exerted. 
And sometimes it makes the gills look like sugar of, because of the abundance. Yeah, there's various adjectives they use oh. um, to describe the, the appearance of, of a gill edge that's got all these chylos, so many chylocystidia on it that you can mm -hmm. see with the naked eye, there's, there's something mm -hmm. there. Thanks. What's that word that I keep forgetting that they use for like when there's a big row of chylocystidia? It's not a barricade. It's a um, palisade. Palisade. Yes, I oh. keep forgetting that word. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. So this is 400 x of the same um, edge of the uh, of the gill with the chylocystidia, and it has some kind of texture. You can see there on the bigots of all. all right. Oh, and it has a septa. I didn't, I forgot about that. I, there, there are two on the lower right with septa close to the capitate end. So the base is really like a long mm, hypha thing. Nice. That's it. Yep, that's it for that one. <clears throat> All right, so granulosa. Uh, you cannot see the texture too good on this one, but on the second observation about the same one, you'll see it's so handsome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more texture on the cap surfaces. Yeah. That's usually what you'll see mm -hmm. with foliota granulosa. Although the other one you just showed, I think I, I agree that's what, what those were also. But maybe the rain washed them off or something. Well, my photo wasn't too good. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. the photo might, might mm -hmm. yeah, the resolution might have been a little blurry. Yeah. So you can learn to recognize these. Um, for Lyota. It's very small, it's very handsome, and nothing else looks like that. Well, the one thing that foliota granulosa can be confused with is flamulaster arenacillus. Uh, um, you will see the difference on the stem, yeah? Yeah, the stem of the flamulaster is usually more ornamented. Mm -hmm. The scales on the cap are usually a little more uh, a larger, um, and the and the margin of the cap usually has appendiculate material in the, in the form of triangular uh, pieces hanging off the edge. But those, those traits can become eroded away on flamulaster. And then it looks a lot like foliota granulosa. And, and to make matters worse, the micro, at least the spores, oh. the spores are very similar. They're like the same oh. size. They look the same. The spore prints, their color is very similar. I've been confused by those two a few times. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I have an observation to the flamulaster in Nacillus. Mm -hmm. With the details that you mentioned, you'll see. You wanna look at that one next? Yeah, do flamulaster and then, yeah. So we can compare. Thanks. So you can see these pieces hanging on the, Triangular, marginal pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, Imagine if those were like off. got washed away <laughs> by rain or something. Right, yeah. it would look a lot like foliota granulosa. You're right. Yep. Mm -hmm. But the scales are a little bigger on the cap on flamulaster, also. Okay. And let's see the stem. If I got a good photo of this. Yeah, stem. usually the stem's more ornamented. Oh, I uh, didn't have a good photo of the stem, but for me, it was enough to see those uh, different fe features on the cap. Yeah, you see the yeah. that was the picture here of the close up. You can really see how big the, mm -hmm. the scales are on the cap. Um, so they wouldn't be that big on uh, foliota mm -hmm. granulosa. They're more like grains on fo foliota granulosa. Mm -hmm. And these are like okay. little, like, like um, Points. cones sticking pyramids. pyramids or something sticking mm -hmm. up. But they do, they are similar, you know. Mm -hmm. 
good thing to know, okay? But I was lucky that I found it with this marginal leftovers, whatever that is. That, the, that appendiculate stuff tends to hang on pretty well in my experience. I haven't seen this species in a few years. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> mm -hmm. I used to see it in the spring usually, but it's been a while. It's been at least five years, I think, since I've seen it. I don't remember the time when I saw this one. The, yeah, August. August wow. 15th. Summer. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that, that's just when I used to. It's. I think you know. If you look in in descriptions, it's got a, it's got a long fruiting season potentially. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Again, and my last one is some. It's a little beauty that I found in Kitatini. I never went to Kitatini before. I don't know if that was our first time. The club going there, and I was. The photos are not so good, but the features are really remarkable. It has a very long stem in relation to the size of the cap. Cap is really small. And it has this prominent um, ring, you said that? The ring, yeah, very close to, yeah. Mm -hmm. This whole, I don't know, oops. There. So, oh, can see. That a, doesn't that ring move up and down? You kind of, you can slide oh, it. I no, I don't think. I don't think you can break it off. It's pretty fragile. I mean, if you're very, very, very careful, maybe you can detach it. Okay. Um, and, oh, you know what? I think sometimes you can. This one doesn't look particularly detachable. I think I have a picture of one where mine is like a ring around it. It's loose. You know what? I think I, I have a couple of photos like that too. Okay, so yeah, I guess I guess you're right. Sometimes and, you can detach that ring. And these also have amatoxins in them, don't they? They're deadly. Yeah, they used to be in Conosity, and then they made this new genus, Foliotina, and I suspect they erected that genus before DNA showed that these guys are not in the Strafariaceae. So why why would you call them a name that basically means you know like a little foliota sort of? Mm. But um, I guess you know. I guess I was just based on what they look like, huh? That was based on what they look like in the brown spores. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you can see some remnants on the edge, on the margin. I didn't notice that until now. And some kind of texture on the stem too. In some photos that I was looking, I can't show that on mine. The photos were really bad. There is some um, striations towards the margin on the cap, but not, not on mine. I did some micro on it. It was really, really cool to find it. I never found it before and we don't find it too often it's not that common in our forays it's kind of a mulch wood chip sort of species oh yeah that i found it in the woods too but like on really well decayed mulch like like a where there's a log that's really really rotten and it's mm -hmm. barely discernible as being a log you know I'll find it in places like that the spores do look a little bit like foliota spores look at that mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I made a mistake there. Spores. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, spores. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it until now. I apologize for that. And I found it in in Kitatini. I went like in some rocks, and there was a lot of like leaves and maybe pieces of wood. I didn't see that. And there it was only one, like hidden, almost like hidden. But I was so happy that I found that. Right. That's I interesting. think they might consider this to be a species complex. I'm not mm -hmm. sure I'd have to look that up. I, it's interesting you say you only found the one two because that's been my experience with it. Mm -hmm. I think I found it twice and both times I found it underneath of logs. Like I hmm. flipped the log up and there was one single one oh. growing underneath of there where it was like really starting to rot. That's a cool find, yep. And again, Thank this you. this one is deadly. Not that I think too many people are eating many in the way, many things in the way of foliota type stuff. But sometimes you hear people eating them. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you. Question Thank you. the suffix uh, Tina. 
seen that on a, a few different genus names. I'm wondering if that um, refers to it being diminutive in size. Is that a reasonable thing or is that just happenstance? Anybody, yeah. anybody know the answer to that? Do we, I, I had kind of why assumed Tina? that. Why is it foliotina? Tina? Is that what it, you're talking about? Yeah, diminutive, yeah. small. Yeah, Ina means that, little. Does it? Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. And for bolides, it's uh, Elvis, like bullet Elvis. Okay. Hmm. All right, good. Learn something on that. Ina for female and Ino for masculine. O is masculine and A is feminine. Ah, like Nina and Nina. Yeah, Nina and Nino, yep. All right, cool. All right, Dave. Thanks, Marisol, for your observations. You're welcome, thank you. All right, Dave has okay. a lot of, you have a lot of species here, don't you? Yeah, these are just from this year. These are from last year, 2021. So well, oh, I've got a folio to granulosa. So we've already seen this species, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. Marisol's uh, portrayal of it was really good. As she said, it's typically small, grainy cap, um, brown spore print. These are particularly small, these two. And I'm not sure if I, if I got a picture of the spores here or if I did anything with these. But Marisol's description was really good. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, just, I just want, I'm just disinterested now. Did I actually, did I take a picture of spores here? Did I get anything? No. Well, I guess not. So, but if you look at the cap though, you'll see the grainy appearance again. So we can just really quickly see that. See, it's got that grainy appearance. Yeah, there we go. And as you can see, that's not all that different than that flamulaster. But I think I probably did a little bit of work with this and rolled out flamulaster somehow. Anyway, that's that's what I called this, foliotic granulosa. Now, this is one that people find and that they think, how could this possibly be a foliota? Um, I guess DNA puts it into foliota. It's been in foliota for a long time. It grows on the ground. It's got usually a slimy cap when it's young. These are, this, this particular observation, these are really old. Um, I found these, I think in December and they're already, the caps are discoloring. Uh, usually you don't see a brown disc like that. These, these had probably frozen and thawed. Um, but when they're, when they're fresh and in good shape, they look like hebaloma. Um, or wait, there's something else that they look like too. Oh, I can't think of. Well, usually hebaloma is what people will say they look like. Um, notched gills. I think the gills are notched. They're maybe just, uh, maybe just add next. Um, so that looks, these are kind of old though. So the traits are not particularly de dependable in these pictures. Um, yeah, it looks like those gills were kind of notched, you know, before before they spread out. Um, brown spore print. See, that's one. But that's another thing that's sort of similar to hebaloma. The spore print color is not all that different. It's maybe a little bit darker than the typical hebaloma, but the spores look a lot different. The spores look like typical foliota spores, fairly symmetric, um, length to width quotient, maybe near two. Um, you know, most hebaloma spores are like amygdaloid. They, they have that humpback almond shape. Um, and then there's usually the surface of hebaloma spores are usually at least a little bit textured. Uh, but that spore print color there, you can see it's brown spores. That's not that different than what you'll see with a hebaloma. In fact, pretty darn similar, uh, this collection. And then we get to the spores. Did I get spores from this thing? Let's see. Yeah, it's not the greatest picture. Um, spores are kind of small, fairly symmetric. Spores are really small for these guys. See, the spores are kind of symmetric. They're smooth. You know, they're not showing any kind of texture on the surface. Um, they're more, more or less, 
pretty darn elliptical. Um, so there's not like there's no asymmetry in these spores uh, for the most part. I mean, a few of them are a little bit bean shaped. Um, but as soon as you see the spores, right, then you know, well, that's probably not a hemoloma. There's other differences as well. Um, yeah, there we go. See, some of the spores, the Q is up near two. Um, Are hemoloba spores different? They're usually asymmetric. They're, uh, the shape is usually given as, I think the word is amygdaloid, which basically means shaped like an almond. But eh, I'm not, amygdaloid is a little bit different than shaped like an almond. It's, um, they're asymmetric. In other words, like one, one side of the long side bulges a little bit. Like, um, and then um, the apex is, is kind of tapers down a little bit more dramatically than these guys. These guys are really nice and rounded on the ends. I mean, with a few exceptions, some of them might have got, you know, some of them might be a little bit squished or something under the under the slip um, that, I, that I mounted, used to mount these. Um, but yeah, Hebel, if, if you go online, you can find, if, I think Mushroom Expert probably has a few pictures of Hebeloma spores. And um, Champignon du Quebec, they'll, they'll have some pictures also. Um, also, I, I believe... Um, uh, most foliolas have porosystidia. You know, if you do the work to um, figure out that you're looking at porosystidia as opposed to chylosystidia, and you find porosystidia, it's probably not a hebeloma. And you know what? I just found out, and I forget who just told me this, or I just read it someplace. I forget where I saw this, but this is a great idea. So the classic way of telling porosystidia from chylosystidia is to perform what's called a Roman aqueduct uh, section on, on, on the gills, on the hymenium, and, and cut all, also cut through the, the, the context of the cap. You have to make the section really, really, really thin. And they tell you to use a brand new razor blade every time you make another section. Now, I've looked at a lot of mushrooms. I'm not about to, you know, um, Try you know to visit the CVS pharmacy twice a week to stock up on razor blades all the time. And, and besides, I'm not very good at making these Roman aqueduct sections anyway. They they require some really fine tuned, small dexterity type stuff, right? So here's the suggestion I heard. Somebody ju I just read this someplace. Take a gill, cut off the edge, get rid of the edge, throw it out. Look at the rest of the gill. And if you find cystidia, they're going to be pleurocystidia. Isn't that a great suggestion? Hey, yes. Hey, yes. I do that. That's what I do, and I use a tweezers. Yeah, that's a great. Well, that's a great way to do it. That's, that's because a, then that's you know idea. you found some pleurocystidia. I came. I had no idea, and I, that's what I do. But yeah. first, I do the edge of the gill, and then I get rid yes. of the gill, and I know where I don't have that edge, and then I made a cut of the next layer. Yeah, I. The next you know, section. I <laughs> Still get a little confused sometimes with whether I'm looking, whether I found the edge of a gill because I'll get a piece onto the slide, put you know put some fluid on it and put the slip over it, and then it might move around a little bit and then I like forget where the edge is. <laughs> so Dave, yeah, you know what I do? I made them it's different size. So when I do the edge of the oh. gill, it's always a long piece, so I don't oh. get confused. When I do yeah, well, that's a good idea. I still get a, <laughs> I, I do that too, but I still yeah, get a yeah. little confused. Yeah, but, those, but that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm not sure what we're seeing here, whether this is a pleurocystidium or a chylocystidium. Um, at, for, the, for the reason that I just sort of explained, really. Um, but that's a, certainly a hymenial cystidium. And the thing near the apex is just a spore that's stuck to it. It's not any kind of weird ornamentation. Um, Dave, yeah, I, I think one of the things is also um, generally the the um, hebeloma will smell of radish or some sort of smell like that, and foliota don't necessarily. I don't think they smell, do they? Now foliotas don't smell like much of anything, but not all the hebelomas smell. Um, the ones that are in the same section with crustulina formi 
those smell like radishes and i think maybe a few of the other ones and then there's this other section s a c c h etc <laughs> the it's the section is named like with with the word saccharin sort of in there they smell sweet they smell like sugar um but i think but some of the hebelomas i have found um they have they haven't smelled like much of anything so it, it can be kind of confusing. The hebelomas are more apt to um, to have a lot of chylocystidia and no chlorocystidia. So are are these are they saprobic on the pine needles? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and you can find them on leaf litter also, but I think these are mostly under under pine. I tend to find these under pine. These were on my property under white pine in the needles. They're, they're late, these come out late. Now, having said that, when I was in the Adirondacks and, and I went, I was hunting mushrooms with Adirondacks the one day was with, with Sue Hopkins, who's here tonight. Um, we found some Hebeloma, or I'm, I'm sorry, Foliota lenta. And that was back in um, late September. But that's just because, you know, late September in the Adirondacks is like, early November in Pennsylvania. So, but they're late. These foliota lenta are late occurring. And they're, I, I always find them on the ground. I don't find them on wood. This is not a particularly good, I think I've got another one of this, another observation of the same species here. And these hopefully, uh, this, ah, here we are from the Adirondacks, from, from where I went with Sue. This, so this one's a little fresher. It was made probably younger. I probably did, had not froze. froze. Uh, so you can see it's not, it doesn't have that dark disc. That's something that I guess just um, was a bit of an anomaly. But look at this really looks like a hebeloma with quite a bit. The gill attachment might is probably a little different than a hebeloma. These are not all that notched really as I, so I may have misrepresented that trait. They're, these look kind of adnate. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, they look more or less adnate. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, more or less adnate, I'd say. Oh, uh, um, Henry always said that the um, that the uh, uh, Becca always said said that there was like right under the cap between right where the gills and the and the top of the 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 stipe. There's a roughage, like a little um, uh, granular. Oh, kind of oh, hebeloma. Yeah, hebeloma have cholocystidia. Most of the most of them have cholocystidia, and you and like like um, chylocystidia on on the gill edges in and mass that you can see with the naked eye. You can see the cholocystidia on hebeloma, and and they look like little flakes or grains, mostly concentrated near the apex of the stalk. And mm -hmm. yes, yes, that that's that. I don't think these this foliota is going to have anything like that. Yeah, the stock is more or less smooth, especially well, especially near the apex is where is the important thing. And here we can see the small, more or less symmetric, smooth spores again. Same like same like that last one. So this these were the same species. This one that we're looking at now, and the one you know the last one. And you can see the spores are pretty much identical. Um, there might have been a little tiny difference in size, but they pretty much look the same. Fairly symmetric for the most part and smooth. Not particularly dark uh, uh, when mounted. These are mounted in KOH. So next time I find foliotas, I will mount in um, KOH, I'll mount gill material also. Now, is that growing on wood? No, that's just where I put them. I put them on this piece of wood for the photograph. That's all. Yeah. Okay, so there they are, foliota lenta. Usually, especially when they're wet, they're kind of, the cap is fairly slimy. Mm -hmm. So it was mentioned a little while ago, you know, does anybody eat um, foliotas? Um, I believe that Charles McIlvain, <laughs> um, there was one or two foliotas that he actually liked. And um, there's no accounting for taste, I guess, because 
McIlvain described one of them as quite like the marshmallow confection, but with no flavor. And in his mind, that was good. So <laughs> I did eat Foliota, what I, what I called Aravella back, back then, um, which you can see here, I've, as Marisol pointed out, Limonella Aravella, really hard to tell apart. Um, you need to, to examine the spores and measure them. Uh, but I did eat it a long time ago. I didn't think it was, it was very good. I ate some other kind of foliota many years ago as well, and I didn't think it was, it was, it, it, to me, it wasn't any good. It didn't taste like anything. The texture wasn't all that great. Um, so. On the, on the limonella, now I don't know an aravella, but a limonella, if you put a little KOH on the cap, it will turn orange. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if that's true of aravella. Maybe not. If not, that would be a way potentially to tell the difference without having to um, look at spores with a microscope. Oh, you know so. what? I was thinking about this. I, I was trying to remember. Um, you guys ever hear of Namiko mushrooms? Yeah, I think that's a, a cultivated. That's a cultivated foliota. Foliota that micro. A, that's a foliota, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, they Wikipedia. grow them in Europe, I guess. Yep, foliota microscope. Oh, Japan. Yeah. Yeah, and they're real slimy. They grow oh, here. Oh, okay. They're cultivated here. Right. Oh, they yeah. cult I've never seen I've them here. No, I've, I've seen I've... them in the, I think, Field and Forest catalog. Yep. yep. Oh, I, I, actually, I actually grow them. Yeah. Oh, huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I've bought, I've slimy. They're good, good in soup. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as the uh, like the miso soup, you can just throw it in. Oh, there's a polio that people do eat. All right, let's okay. look at limonella. I did want to ask: Is there anybody that wanted to share from their own screens? I always ask that so I know how to judge how fast we have to go. If anybody else has foliotas that they want to share tonight. If you do type your name into the chat I, also. This was up in the Adirondacks. I just took a picture and I I was running out of um, microscope slides to collect spores on. Because what I did when I was on vacation this year in, in the Adirondacks and then in Vermont, I collected spore samples and just wrapped them in wax paper and took them all home. And, and later on, um, when I got home, I looked at them with my microscope. That works pretty well, by the way. You know you have to take some microscope slides with you. And I was afraid I was going to run out. So I didn't get spore samples from everything. This was on a birch tree. So once again, is it Limonella? Is it Aravella? I don't, I don't think you, you can tell just from the picture. I said, I don't know why I put Limonella as a higher probability. I'm not sure why I did that. Um, because I have a more confidence, maybe just because when I do measure spores for these things, um, way more often I find that I have limonella than than aravella. Oh, so I just saw um, folio. What is it? Adip apidosa. Adipidosa. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't is that, that the one. Namiko? That's the the Namiko thing is another species. Oh, chest, right? Chestnut mushrooms. Yeah, they are pretty chestnut. similar. I, I didn't realize they were a foliota either. Oh, okay. So yeah, I don't eat wild foliotas. Like I say, I tried it many years ago, thirty some years ago. I tried a couple of species, and I didn't like them very much. There's another reason. Well, actually, there's a different category of. Mushroom, we'll get to in a little while, I guess, if we have time. It's interesting. I guess though, you can go to the next one. If there, I'm if sorry, there, go I was just, I was just speculating. If there's two really good foliotas that are cultivated, I wonder about you know, some of those other foliotas that are out there. That if there's any not good, in my if experience, the ones I've tried. There's you know, any good wild those. ones. Now, maybe, maybe you use them in certain ways. Like, I, was it Maris who just said a little while ago, put them in soup. I mean, maybe there's certain things you do with them that then they're good. Um, so I think, what did I call this? Spumosa? Spumosa. Yeah. Um, 
it's uh, they certainly look like what spimosis are supposed to look like i'm not sure if i collected spores from these i think this is also from the adirondacks um i think these are supposed i think these are supposed to grow on um yeah 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 it's from the adirondacks also uh, I think they're supposed to grow on rotten conifer wood, and that's pretty. I, I think that's why I found these you know, area with a lot of conifer, and they run these this well decayed mossy log. So that's enough. These look a little bit like lenta, actually. They're not much ornamentation on the caps. They're smaller, maybe a little more color in the cap. It looks like I didn't get any spores from these. Like I said, they were just. Sometimes there's just too many mushrooms, <laughs> so, I, so I don't examine every everything. And boy, that that week we were on vacation in the Adirondacks in Vermont. There were so many mushrooms that week; it was it was quite amazing. So I just I only got a picture of those, but I think that's what they are. It was like that all summer. Too many mushrooms, too little time. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it rains, it pours and. And then, you know, the other times you go out and, you know, you're, you're happy to find a, one russula, you know. <laughs> Squarosoides and squarosa. Um, I think squarosoides is the one that's supposed to be a little bit tacky on the cap surface. There's differences in spore size as well between squarosa and squarosoides. The manuals list one of these species as mildly toxic and the other as edible. And I'm not, I forget which is which, um, but I guess I, these were called squarosoides. And interestingly, these were found in an area where there's a lot of conifers, but a few hardwood trees mixed in. And um, I examined the spores. I did spore measurements on these. That's right. And the spore measurements matched Squarosoides and not squarosa. So, if I remember correctly, the spores on these did not exceed six microns in length. Um, and squarosa, the spores, the like the smallest ones will be six microns, and they go up to about eight microns long. So that's actually a fairly significant difference. So these are really scale scaly. So the common names for these two species are one of them is called scaly foliota. The other one is called sharp scaly foliota. Uh, supposedly there's a difference in the texture of the scales. Um, I, I wouldn't trust any of that sort of stuff. Atmospheric conditions, humidity levels and rain and so forth can affect texture of the scales. So I think spore size, once again, is what you would really need to do to, to make sure. Um, I've never, even though the one is listed as edible, I've never tried any of the type. So they're kind of, aren't they quite a lot of lookalikes on these things that uh, um, have different spores, like um, uh, leucofoliota and maybe... Uh, well, leucofoliota has white spores. You're I know. Be able if, to, yeah. if, if you're out, if you're out with a whole lot of people starting out, yeah, um, and they pick these things, oh, it's a foliota, and they say, wait, look at the spore print. Because they have a different Look at the spore print. Also, leucofoliota, the the stalk is the lower part of the stalk is sheathed in um, in scales, and they end at the ring, and then the upper part is smooth, I believe. And I think these guys, pretty much the entire stalk has ornamentation. Let's see if the picture bears that out. If there's anywhere you can see that. Yeah, see the scales go like pretty much right up the stock on these. Yeah. And Leucofoliota decorosa, I'm pretty sure um, has like, it almost looks like a, um, oh, what are those little cystoderma? It almost looks like a cystoderma, but it's way more scaly and bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Right on wood too, just like folio. These these guys all grow on wood. These scaly and sharp scaly foliotas grow on wood. They're uh, yeah, they're nice to take pictures of. <laughs> there's another one, isn't it? Hemis uh, Hemisphera. That old. Yeah, that's not foliota anymore, and it's yeah. darker. It's right. darker, and it's got, I think, sort of fluffier scales. Yeah. Um, the spore print's very dark. 
it's spore print looks more like a maybe a really dark agrosabi or maybe a straf almost like a strafaria spore print. You know what? I forgot about that one. I, I find it right on my property and I have pictures of it. And I forgot to include it. Uh, but it looks like it does look a fair amount like it actually looks more like Aravella Limonella. I think that's the one that you would confuse with. Uh, what What is the name of it, Nina? Is it uh, Hemo, Hemistropharia, right? Hamistropharia. I think it's Albo. Right. Creatia, Albo crenulata or something like that. Something like that. Albo something, yeah. Elbow something or other, yeah. It's yeah. It's the scales are a little flatter and fluffier than these guys. Elbow, elbow crenulata. Elbow crenulata, right? Okay. Yeah, and that was in foliota for a long time as well, and I think that's still in the Strafariaceae. I think uh, that might have been one of the genera that was on the list we saw before. So these are these are very picturesque. They, these are really cool to find. They look really nice. McElveen says the caps are yummy. Oh, uh, are they the ones that he says like taste like the marshmallow confection with no flavor or something like that? What he says is its caps are of the very best. Oh, yeah. I think McElveen had wooden teeth and had a hard time chewing things. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I'm not saying that to try to be funny. I think there are some mushrooms that have sort of a, um, you know, a, a texture that requires a little bit of chewing, and some of them he didn't like very much. So I wonder about that. Um, but yeah, his some of the things he liked, you know, I don't know. <laughs> McIlvain ate jack-o'-lanterns and thought they were good. And everybody else got sick. Yeah. Didn't, didn't he say there was like 12 people in the party that got sick? Yeah, he said there was some sort of party and or some <laughs> gathering or something. And those those others who did partake were, were rendered ill or something like that. He <laughs> but said, I, you know, but I found and, them very nice. Because he liked them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next one, species... Yeah, I don't. This one's this is a strange little critter. This one, I thought it might have been a, a flamulaster when I found it, um, and but I think I did some. I did something that told me it's probably not a flamulaster. I think in the, in the notes here I may have written some stuff. Um, yeah, I did some micro on it. And I forget exactly how I eliminated flamulaster, but if you look at the actual mushroom, it looks like a flamulaster. And there are other flamulaster species besides Irinocelus. Irinocelus is like the biggest one. And but most of the flamulaster uh, species produce mushrooms that have these triangular flaps along the margin of the cap. And I think one of the photos here is going to show that. And so I thought maybe flamulaster, I put it as it could be. Um, so Jacob Kalichman, who also calls himself Jacob Polk, he, um, he says he's, he's pretty sure this is a foliota. And that actually makes sense to me. Foliota makes sense to me. Some of the micro, I think. Look at the little flaps, a lot of the appendiculate flaps along the margin. That's why I thought this might be flamulaster. Yeah, not not Arenocelis. I thought maybe some other Flamulaster. Uh, the the Flamulaster is not a real big genus, but there are a few species that that occur in this part of the world, and some of them are really small, and it's just people don't pay that much attention to them. You know, so like this guy, really small, uh, but this is probably some sort of Foliota. Um, yeah, kind of an interesting little mushroom. I'm not sure if I saved it. They may have slipped through my fingers. Yes. Look at the aspect of the gills. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. I, oh, I don't yeah, know what we call that crenate. Oh. Or um, there's another crenulate. But that's okay. probably chylocystidia. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. if I if I scoped that. I mean, sometimes I just don't have time, you know, especially like this past summer, like Sue said a little while ago, so many mushrooms <laughs> okay. uh, that just wasn't time. <laughs> to, to give to give a, attention to all of them of course sometimes I, I i 
you know, sometimes I spend time looking at something that I'm pretty sure I already know what it is. And I should be spending time looking at more at something like this. That's really kind of unusual. Um, so I think I did do a little micro on this though. Yeah, so that looks a little like a foliota granulosa. Um, but Jacob had um, proposed a species name at low confidence. So basically mm -hmm. he doesn't really know what it is either, but he, but he has an idea. Interesting little, little mushroom. Ah, so let's see the spores. See if we've got the typical, fairly symmetric, smooth um, spores. And it looks like, yeah, it looks like these are going to fit that profile. Yep, like, they look like the other spores we've been looking at. Um, it's a little hard to tell to evaluate smoothness uh, with through this particular microscope of mine. It's an old beat up microscope. Uh, the resolution is not great. My better microscope, I can tell ornamentation a little bit better, but I don't get good pictures through it. And then there were the, some weird things in the micro. I, this must have been from the gill edge. This must be, uh, my guess is it's probably just a bunch of, like a bundle of chylocystidia. And that's probably what Maricel was pointing out that we were looking at with naked eye, um, just that when looking at the gills. Probably that. And I'm not sure what this thing is here. Is that a bacidium or is that a cystidium? Probably a cyst. looks probably more like a cystidium. Is that in KOH? Hey, you clean this microscope. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I probably <laughs> mounted this in Congo red, but this old scope doesn't show color very well. Oh, it's because it's very yellow. Yeah, it's it. Maybe I did mount that in KOH. I may have. I should have put it, but I guess I did. Maybe it, did I put that in the notes? Sometimes I do. Interesting little mushroom. It would be nice if I saved it, I suppose. But I guess that's probably a gill edge there. It's. It's really got a lot of, it's probably chylocystidia, my guess. These little things like this, I have a hard time handling them. They're just so small. It's, I have a hard time making a decent section. I should just dig a gill out and do like Maricel said, really. That's probably the most reasonable thing to do. Um, yeah, coloring, I think the spores, coloring. The spores KOH. I put in KOH. Um, I probably put the piece of gill in Congo red. I usually do. I see. Yeah. Okay, so some kind of little folio. It might be granulosa. I don't think so, though. A little bit too much ornamentation on the cap margin. And I guess there's a few things I included here that used to be in folio, but interestingly, um, these are not even in the Strafariaceae. Flamula is in, I mean, it's in some other family. And were these from the Adirondacks? I think they may have been. Yeah, there were a lot of these in the Adirondacks. When I was first finding them, I thought they might be um, um, Gymnopolis because I was getting really rusty spore prints. Look at the spore print on that one cap. You can see it there. It's pretty rusty. And I thought, oh, they must be Gymnopolis. But when I looked at the spores, um, they look like foliota spores. That's why these guys used to be in foliota, I guess. Well, they grow on wood. You know, a lot of foliotas do. Um, and the spores are a lot different than um, gymnopolis spores. Gymnopolis spores are usually shaped like mangoes. And these are, you know, fairly symmetric. You know, a pretty big Q. Q is the quotient of length to width. So you can see the Q on these guys looks like, you know, it's hovering around two. Some of them are, some of them are pretty well surpassing two, it looks like. But once again, smooth, symmetric. Um, I think if you blow this one up, you might be able to see some germ pores. Let's see if we can, we can see any germ pores here. 
So you, these are not foliotas, though. They, but they used to be foliotas. Um, okay, on some of them, on the one end, it looks a little flat, like like a little piece is cut off, sort of. You can see it on its, oh here in the upper left. In the upper left, um, go straight above the arrow. If you go straight above the middle of the arrow, the the second one, now the the middle of the arrow, the thick part of the arrow. Go straight above. Oh, there's another one up right above the point also. Where you can see one end looks like it's kind of truncated. That's a, that's a jarn pour. Right, and sometimes, right. yeah, right. Uh, sometimes you'll actually see a little circle, right? That's like the rim of the opening. Um, once again, this microscope, the resolution is not great. So, so you, you don't really see that. You just see a truncation uh, on the ones that are positioned correctly. But I think that's probably why these guys were in Foliota for a long time. Yeah. Oh, Gymnopolis is in Strafariaceae. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yep. And these guys, these guys are not. These guys are in some other family. I'm not sure which. Dave, what's the name yeah. of the one you just showed? Well, I think those are Flamula alnicola. And the next ones oh. are probably Flamula alnicola also. It used to be Foliota alnicola. And, and may um, I say something? Yeah, sure. There is the way they curl up is very unusual. Uh, I think that Florida? I think that's just because it was really wet, humid, oh. and you know, so sometimes those sorts of things are not true. You know, are not consistent traits. So, um, no, are, they, is that a consistent trait with this one? I'm not sure. Maybe no, it Dave. is. Yes. No, no Dave. I yes. don't mean I don't know this species that you're talking about. I meant you said that this was considered a foliota, but now it belongs to another group. Yeah, it used to be foliota alnicola. And that's what I meant. That yeah. for the other foliotas that we know, they never turn up like this. Oh. That's what I was saying. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, I, I'm you sorry. Know what I, mean? I did yeah. not get your point initially. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think you're right about that. Foliotas don't do that. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't do that. They stay a con, okay. convex mm -hmm. or, or flat. Maybe they get flat, but they're more or less convex. Yeah, no, good point. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and then there's, so that last one, I measured the spores and that's how I got Flamula alnicola. So this is probably the same thing here also, but these are a little younger and they are, and these are really are shaped more like foliotas. These are not, they're probably not as wet or maybe not as old. Um, the um, darkened orange, like reddish, reddish brown um, stock base is, is a flamula kind of thing. And they have partial veil. You can see on, on the one here in the middle, there's a partial veil ripping apart. It's not, it doesn't leave a very good ring. Um, um, yep, so pro that's pro this is probably the same species. It's probably Flamula alnicola, just a little bit younger and the caps aren't as spread out. I think these were also found in the outer. I think these were on Rock Pond Trail. Yeah, these were the ones I really thought these were Gymnopolis um, when I found them. And then when I looked at the spores, or did I look at the spores on these? Not even sure, maybe not, but they're not. After I looked at them a little more, they're not Gymnopolis. They really, they actually don't even look that much like Gymnopolis. So I was just, kind of fooled in the field at first. And the last thing we have here is another thing that used to be in foliota. It used to be foliota veris, which means a springtime foliota. And now it's in Cairnomyces. I, I guess that's how you say it. <laughs> Cuinaromyces uh, marginalis. And um, this is listed as edible in several field guides. I never ate these and I don't plan on ever eating them because even though I think I, 
I can identify them. I've got these posted on Mushroom Observer as I'd call it that, the highest level of confidence. Nobody disagreed. I would still not eat them. Even after looking at the spores and the spores look like fully out of spores, smooth, symmetric, um, a fair, you know, cue that quotient that's, you know, if not, if not too close to two, in other words, the, the length being almost twice the size of the width. Um, and these have germ pores. Look at the germ pores on these guys. They're, they're fairly pronounced. Okay, so all of this put together, it's like, okay, these cannot be Gallerina marginata. <laughs> but they look too much like Gallerina marginata for my taste. I'm, ne I'm never going to eat these guys. They have a lot of hymenial cystidia. I think these are chylocystidia that we'll see, but they really do look like Gallerina marginata. And the spore print color is similar as well. So there's a whole bunch of, of filamentous to um, cylindrical to occasionally enlarged base. And I think there's some sort of name, ventricose maybe. Or is ventricose enlarged in the middle? I forget. Um, but there's a lot of them, a lot of chylocystidia. And, and that is a trait of this species. So I find it in the spring, usually up until about mid-June. So when I'm looking for morels, toward the end of finding morels, I'll start finding these guys on the ground, on wood. Um, they fruit from wood or woody debris so if they're on the ground there's probably there's some little pieces of wood buried um but they used to be foliotis so i thought i'd include them there's also um coernomyces mutabilis um, is another species that used to be in foliotis but i i don't seem to ever find that so i don't have it here but okay one more photo i guess same thing here Cuinarum myces marginalis. These are very pale. So these are hygrophonous. They fade. They start out brown. Those last ones we saw, they're fairly brown on the cap surfaces. These guys are pretty much white. Uh, and you can see here, the one here in the upper left, how the center of the cap is getting really white. So that's, it's fading. It's losing moisture, losing color. And, and so sometimes these will look almost uh, they look like beige, like a really pale beige at times. Uh, usually the ring persists. The spore print is brown. Maybe it's a little bit tending towards rusty. So there are there are some pretty scary similarities to Gallerina marginata. So that's why I, I'm just never going to try eating these. So they're probably not that great anyway, but Okay, so that's all I got. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. All right, Nina. Yeah, here I am. Okay. Uh, which one did you put in first? Ah, uh, these these are things that I got at um, uh, um, Nymph and Nama, and. Uh, just to show the different types of foliota. This is a foliota lubrica. It's very, very slippery and shiny. I don't know too much about the species, but I put it on because they're so different than than, than, than the other type of foliota. Okay, so we don't need to spend a lot of time. It's just going to show the Where Where was this at, Nina? Oregon. Oh, okay. And this one grows terrestrially? Okay, this one is actually from no the second one, uh, not that one. That that one is actually terrestrial. This this was um, from uh, Horseshoe Bend, and this is uh, John Plisky and and uh, Garrett Taylor put the name to it. And I couldn't believe it was polyota. Uh, yeah, it's, it grows in the ground. What's the species on this one? Uh, polyota terrestris. Oh, okay. Is that one of the ones that grows on burnt ground? Uh, I well, there's no burnt ground there in okay. Hoshu Bend, so I I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly because it was on the table, and uh, they put this name to it, and I just was surprised because it, I I would have never guessed 
So I figured, well, polio, that's why I'm curious about polio. It seems like it's kind of, well, if you don't know what it is, well, maybe it's a polio. <laughs> well, it looks a little like a flamula also. Yeah. There, there's, this, is from, uh, this is from the, uh, from, from the Oregon. And this was polio to terrestris. I, I put this in because it seems like it can, uh, the other one looked like it's single, but this is growing in a group. So that, that's, that's from Horseshoe Bend and the other one is uh, from Oregon, also terrestrial. That's the that's gills and the next one is the cap there. And I, and I guess that grows with us, we've got to look for it. So I don't have too much to say about it, but you know, I just want to put that on. Okay, next. So you think that grows around here or is it just it grows, a... in, grows in Horseshoe Bend, where we go. Where's, and... where's Horseshoe Bend? Oh, sorry. Um, it's in there um, in central Jersey. Oh, okay. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought, yeah, I thought you said it was Oregon, yeah. but that's the other well, one. No, okay. no, no. The, the, the ones with the labels are from Oregon. And, and, and the, the, the one without a label was from Horseshoe Bend. So she, has oh, a, okay. she has a sample of it from both Oregon and New Jersey. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, let's see. What have I got? Oh, this is another, This is one of your uh, polio gran granulosa. But you, we've already seen that. It's spelled wrong anyway. This one was from. This was from um, uh, Peak uh, uh, Poconos, where you know Kirkridge area. Yep. Okay. Um, this is from Frank and Parker. This is uh, folio de Cast It's it's. It, it, I didn't know what it was. Uh, Liz didn't know what it was. We looked at it. Said, well, it's not a. It's not a court in Aris. I don't know what the heck it is. So we put it and uh, Igor did DNA on it, and this is what it turned out to be. Now, before someone mentioned a folio called chestnut folio. I guess that will be it. Uh, no, I don't know. This is doesn't foliota castanius mean like chestnut foliota? It grows they, in the pine. It was you no, can they see taste not of uh, spots on it. Little, um, yeah, that's foliota adiposa. Okay, Neat. I don't know why it's called chestnut. Maybe it's just a color. Because oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it just goes to show where com how common names can be confusing. Really. Right. So that's in Franklin Park in Chatsworth, New Jersey, Pine Barrens. Ah, in what area, Nina? Uh, near so, the uh, river, Savoy, near the creek? Savoy, no, Savoy Boulevard, right on the railroad tracks. Oh, you haven't been there. Okay. Right on oh, the edge yeah. of the railroad tracks. Cool. Yeah. In what time? Uh, November. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah. You found this one this year? Uh, last year. Oh, nice. Because oh. Igor already did a DNA on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I call this year just 2021. Okay, yeah. Good. Well, no, it was this was uh, 2020 because uh, oh. yeah, because oh, okay, okay. he hasn't done a DNA on 2021 yet. Okay, cool. And that's that's the spores there. So. And that's dried up. It just shows the gills little thing yeah and then that, that's this is a granulosa from from quebec and that looks a lot like um uh gallerina <laughs> probably looks like dark. cystoderma yeah i guess it's kind of dark but that's that's what they they call that a folio de granulosa oh i see i was i was looking at something i was looking at the shadows on the stocks and thinking that that was um, um, a sheath um, lower part of the stock. It's not, it's a shadow. Okay. Well, the trouble with so many of these places is there's never enough light. You go in these places and it, it's like they got these little lights and you, you, you're trying to take photographs and <laughs> well, you know, it's like. And it's yeah, I take stuff outside. Yeah. Yeah, I, I take stuff off the tape. If I want to photograph something at one of the big forays, I just take it off the table and take it outside. Right. But you can use LED light, a lamp. LED. Oh, yeah. pardon, you don't say that, okay. LED. Yeah. Right. 
Okay, and then I have that double one, that one you had, um, and then, then then I got a picture of the coop, coo what is it? Yeah, that thing, right there. That's what mine looks like. See, mine was mine was deep, deep, deep in the moss, in the bog. I suppose there must have been wood underneath. I don't know. Probably. I find them on the ground. I find them on mossy logs. I find them in mud. They grow every place. These, yeah. but that's I'd call that's what I'd call this. Yeah. Same thing. Well, it is. It is because the DNA was done on it. Yeah. Yeah. What's this species? A uh, cuckoo. Well, you say it. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Yeah. Cuckoo. Yeah. Mycetes or yeah. something like that. What's this species? Marginalis. Uh, Yep. Okay, okay, thanks. Right. Anyway, DNA was done on it. So that's 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 pretty much what it is. Yeah. There's another picture. This picture was taken uh from the Princeton foray. Um I think Terry Terry put a name to it from the Princeton foray. Yeah, you can see the caps fading uh -huh. right on wood. You can see the rings on the stalks on the upper part of the photo here, the ones that are posed on top of the log. So you, you can see a lot of traits here. Right on wood this time. Right. You're talking about the same quirinomyces? Yeah. Ginellus? Yep. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah. Okay. They look different. They look very, to me, they look very different. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And they grow, they always grow early in the year, like in May, mm -hmm. April, May, early. Yeah. Okay. And that's the, uh, that, that right there's the, uh, uh, that's, that's what used to be, Ferris, Ferris. And that's uh, from the, where is that? I guess it's Frank, I don't know if that's Franklin Park or something, or where, where is it? Yeah, yeah, okay. SPV. Kind of dried out. I think I've come to recognize this species pretty well because some years I see, literally, I'll see a thousand of them. Uh -huh. Huh. They're, they're, they can be just so common some years, like late May. Right. When yeah. there's when there's hardly anything else out, you just see these over and over and over again. But it's it's uh, yeah. Yeah, but they, they do vary so much. I mean, really, it are kind of one looks almost like a mycene, and the other one looks like a really solid mushroom. I don't know, <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, sometimes they're striate. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Oh. Cool. Well, thank you, Nina. Uh huh. Uh, so did you want to share something? Yeah, let me try. Um, it's the Leucofoliota. Oh, oh, all right. Somebody has to stop sharing. Oh, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let me try it again. Tell me if you can see it. Yep. Yeah, this is pretty distinctive. I, I, I've only seen it a couple of times when I've been up here in the Adirondacks. And, um, you know, I said foliota, foliota, but you could tell, and I did a spore print and it was white. I, I had to email uh, Noah Siegel, which was stupid because it is in Tim Baroni's book. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's a good picture, but the little scales on the top are very distinctive and also on the stem. Um, and it has a distinct, um, kind of separation up here where it was attached to the edge of the cap and then it's a little bit of area that's that's kind of plain with nothing much on it but it's a beautiful beautiful little mushroom when you do see it on wood I don't I forget but it's probably conifer wood but I don't remember that for sure but it's very distinctive so I won't forget it so leucofoliota yeah I probably spelled it wrong but leuco being white but foliota is known to have the uh, brown spore print so that's why i guess somebody created the genus like that anyway Can i zoom in on that a little bit 
Oh, Zoom. Let me see. How do I do that? Oh, yeah. Wait, wait. Maybe. For the cat. That is one good looking mushroom. Yeah, yeah it really is. It almost looks like meringue on top of a, a, a pie or something. <laughs> yeah. Tiny little yeah. things. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And it feels and like the, that too. Was oh. the decoration, it was hard? Is that what you were about to say? It wasn't as like feathery kind of? It was. It wasn't that soft, no. It cool. was, was kind of in between. It was. You you could sort of run your finger across it and it wasn't going to move it. I I think the the texture of the scales might vary with um, moisture. Yeah, right. Yeah, I would say that's probably right. Um, and this you know had been out obviously a day or so and uh, was probably dried up a little bit. But obviously, this you know these were three were growing on the log, so this one was not opened out all the way, so it was still you know um, the texture became somewhat stiff after it was opened out all the way. I had other pictures, but since I'm not clever enough how to do that all on the same sh uh, screen sharing, I. I Thought I'd show you, try and show you this one at least. Anyway. Well, it's a good one. Yeah. No mistake of what it was once I learned what it was. Thank you, Luke. Awesome. Thanks, Susan. So stop share, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Add two of them we've already seen them but we, i think we only saw one example of each so the flamulaster aaron cialis cialis aaron cialis i can't say it <laughs> this is the one we were talking about a little while ago um that's very difficult uh, to tell with the, would we say the granulata? Is that granulata? Is that how we said that? Granulosa. Granulosa. Pretty similar. Pretty similar. We discussed this pretty heavily back in the fall when I found it. We ended up feeling like it was flamulaster. Look at the stipe on it. I think that was one of the defining features. Yeah, that looks different than the foliata. More, more ornamentation. And the scales on the cap are really pretty tall and sharp. There's triangles are, oh, there's the triangles. There you go. All right. All oh, right, the, uh, the hanging material off the edges. Is it me or do the gillages look redder, darker? Uh, they do in this the, picture. I think the gills on these start out fairly pale, beigey, whitish kind of. And this one, this one's just probably a little old and dried out, really. Looks marginal. The spores are dark. The spores yeah, are I dark. just I just wondered if it's if that's a feature that the gill edge is darker. I think it varies with age. All right, so I have that one. And this one again, the Foliotina. Well, am I still here? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Here, I'm going to start the server. Oh, oh he was oh, okay. taking his time. Okay. Hmm. Doesn't want to load. Huh. 
I don't know what's going on there. Ah, oh, there we go. Poliotina rugosa. So this is the one that we were saying used to be canosophy with the amatoxins growing in the super well decayed, uh, like mulchy, woody debris. It was growing bent like that? Yeah, this is-, is there, Wow, that's a- Is it growing out of another one? That's no, a that, ring. That's the, that's the ring. That's the ring. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> yes. This is one that I found under a log. That's I think that's why it's bent like that, because it was- Kneeling. It was trying to get out from underneath that log. But see, I, I seem to remember oh, that yeah. that was separated. I actually moved that around a little bit. Yeah, that looks that looks re, uh, removable. You can like you can slide it. All right, so not a foliota, but something that was once thought to be like a foliota. Can you get to the first picture quickly? And look the. And another photo, I can see the striations. The, yeah, they, sorry, there's, I something, saw uh, yeah, there's something growing next to it. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can see them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this guy has pretty thin flesh compared to the size of the gills, it looks like. Yeah. And these things are really, every, well, I've only ever seen it twice in my life, but then also looking at Maricel's pictures too. I mean, they're really small, they're really thin. Okay, I'm not, not much to them. All right. Nice That's job it. photoing such tiny things. Thank you. And that was, I recall, that was really late in the year. Yeah, that was, late November in 2019 that I found that. So fairly late in the year. For Philadelphia, that's late in the year. So. Okay, that was everything I think I had to share. These other things are other foliotas I never identified in that Lemonella type group. All right, does anybody else have any other foliotas they wanna discuss or anything? Any other foliota related stuff they want to discuss? Uh, Luke, I can probably go to Mushroom Observer and find a Hemistrophoria um, albocranulata if you like. It'll just take a few minutes. I can email it to you. Okay, that sounds cool. Um, somebody was asking at the beginning, I think it might have been Mike. I think he was saying he had some other stuff he would like to share. So we might as well open this up now. Um, if people have any other observations they'd like to look at. Was that you, Mike, at the beginning? Oh, I don't think Mike's here anymore. Well, does anybody have anything else they'd like to look at? Oh, Brandon, go for it. All right, cool. So I found this really neat uh, resupinate polypore today. Let me get to it. And before I get there, I just want to take a look at the name that I proposed for it. And it's uh, Felinidium ferraginiofuscum, if anyone is familiar with that. I know that there are few resupinate uh, uh, that look like that. Yeah, and it was super red. Let me get the best one to share first. Let's take a look. Let's start with this one. So I found it on this little kind of stump here. And it had two, it was presenting in two waves. You can kind of see the change happening here. Um, it has the kind of poroid surface to the left that's a little duller, and then the shinier portion was like this, I don't even know how to describe it, like a, almost like a veil. It was like a layer of tissue covering the pore surface that you could almost peel away. So 
is cool. But it had that really beautiful red coloration to it. And these kind of tears that you can see, that was all natural. And I think it was kind of caused by freezing and maybe it was kind of warm today. So it kind of ripped seams throughout the actual fruiting body. This is a super zoomed in version. The pores were very, very small, tiny. And to the eye, they looked rounded, but these look a little angular on the photo here. Anybody have any opinions thus far? No. Did, you, did you look at it with the lens? Because if it is the genus that you're thinking, it will have set eye inside. In the inside the pores, and some of them have setae on the margin. Okay. Oh, this is the whole thing is too white. So this is the bottom of. I found that log kind of propped up, growing, and this is mm -hmm. the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. And it is the same. It is the same fungus. Mm -hmm. It's tough to see, but you can see the poroid surface growing in the center of the white on the outside here. When I walked up to it, I thought it was a like a stereo, maybe. If um, for that, those the genus that you're talking about, the color is wrong. The white. It is. The color. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, in, in that case, I have absolutely no idea what it is. I just I thought it was really, really cool looking. Is that a conifer? Uh, no, this was, I, I believe this was a hardwood. Oh. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the photos didn't do it the best justice. It makes it look a little darker, but I mean, mm -hmm. it was a pretty beautiful red. Couldn't nope. be an old piece of oak. Let me show you this photograph. So this is kind of what I was talking about. The what's the best way to describe this? Up in the top, the pores are exposed in that where it's splitting. But kind of right here, there's a thin layer of it, very. It, it was super thin and super delicate, almost like paper that you could peel away from the pore surface. It was really cool. Perhaps some seriporia. You said seriporia? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, when that happens, yeah. I was just gonna say, I was kind of thinking that too, Marisol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what I, I think- at, I, I looked at that as well as a possibility. Uh, what I am thinking is that because it might be not perennial, at this point it looks gelatinous. It's gelatinizing. It's falling apart. Mm. Uh, yeah. Maybe this is. Uh, Let me show you this photo just real quick. Um, and and this photo I think led more to Seriaporius. I, I kind of thought Seraporia too, just from the color, but when you were showing the pores, they looked a little bit round, but Seraporia often has like a really kind of like wacky, elongated pores a little bit. Elongated? Kind of like, 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 kind of like all over the place. If you just like a Google a picture of Seraporia, yeah. you'll see what I mean, where they're kind of and also it has a margin, an area, it's, yeah, it's lighter. And, and I have found, because I look for these um, things through winter, several times I have found them and the color is more intense, it's deeper because of the cold and they are falling apart too. Yeah. If you look closer with the lens, you'll see that they are falling apart. It's getting too old. 
Yeah, I would look at maybe like Seraporia Corporea. Okay. Seraporia. That looks. Seraporia. And it depends on where is it. It is growing. If on uh, on hardwoods or conifers, you will have to. They might tell you if you read information about it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. If it is on hardwoods is one name. If it is on conifer, it's another one. Do you have any information on how large the pores are on Seriaporia? Because you can see here on this kind of split, right mm -hmm. where I'm zooming in, they're pretty deep, right? The tubes. You the made. tubes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the yeah. tubes. Sorry. Brandon, I can send you information through an email. Okay. Yeah, do that. Right now myself. I can't do it, but but I will. Yeah. Okay. I can I can look at it myself too. Oh, okay. But yeah, it's Ser Seriaporia, uh, Luke, you said, Purpurea? Purpurea. Dragon type. Because it seems to be like a complex, and I was reading about it a few days ago, and then yeah, it's complication, but yeah, Seriaporia will be good enough, but you can dig deeper. Yes. All right. Good All stuff. Right. Thanks for the help. Okay. So this is Hemistrafaria. Yeah, Hemistrafaria albocranulata. It looks just like a foliota. It used to be in foliota. It looks like foliota. It looks like the ones in the Aravella, uh, Limonella. Um, um, group. This is, I find this pretty much every other year in the same spot. Well, I found it in a few different spots, but this one in particular grows at the base of a, um, a living but old and weak maple. What is that maple up so Is that a sugar maple or a yeah, sugar maple? And the spore print is darker. Than, than a typical foliota. And and the, the the overall aspect is a little darker as well. The scales are a little darker, but it really does look like foliota aravella. And different times of the year, I don't find it at the same time of the year every year. The gills are a little darker too. They look, they look like strafaria gills almost. They're that sort of dark gray setting. And this is an interesting mushroom that used to be a foliota. Used to be foliota albo crenulata. The spores are pretty big too on these guys. And the spores don't look like foliota spores to me. Um, you can see there's... Um, uh, if, it's apiculus, right? It's on the spore. Sterigmata is on the Bastidia, right? So the you can see apiculi on these guys. Now these are a little bit more amygdala form. So see, see they're kind of like asymmetric, like one side kind of bulges out a little further than the other side. So that would be, these look a little bit more like hebeloma spores than, than foliota spores. To, to my eye, and it depends on how they're profiled. Also, some of them are some of them look rather symmetric because that's just the way they're profiled. So these spores are pretty big. I think they, I think if um, Luke, if you bring the photo up to where we can see the the rest of the arrow, I think these spores probably are up to twelve microns. Thereabouts. I may have put it right on here, an estimate. So that's kind of big for foliota spores too. The foliota spores are usually not that big. I guess I didn't, um, but I think the spores on these guys can be up to about 13 microns. I'd have to have to look it up. So there's that one. And I thought that would be a good one to show because it's pretty darn similar to foliota aravella. All right, cool. Okay. 
All right. Uh, Mary, you want to show us your strange thing from September of twenty one, and then we can yeah. dis- then we can discuss I, I, uh, what we want to look at next week. Yeah, sorry. Um, I have to figure out how to share my screen. Okay, there it goes. And where am I? <laughs> sorry. Um, between the camera obscuring my banner on top now there it is so yeah this this one stumped me a bit um this is a this is the um politis uh what do you call it uh ori orti cultus what is something it, it's the one one that grew typically on the lawn but um there's something else growing on the side of it and i wondered if that is a totally parasitized bullet that we see in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's hypomyces. Is it the hypomyces? Um, covering the one. Hypomy- what is it? Trisospermus, I think? Trisospermus. Trisospermus. But why didn't, here... infect, why didn't it infect the second one? They that's actually... the larynx. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny the way only the uh-huh. one is infected yeah. and the other one isn't. And look at how so fat strange. this stem is. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely did that something to the mushroom. Um, wow. I typically don't. Yeah, that is that was very strange to me. Mm-hmm. It could and be that, because they're in love. They love. <laughs> okay. That one Nuts. only wants that one. No other one will do. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Um, again, what is that uh, parasitic fungus name again? Hippomyces. Oh, hippomyces. I think it's chrysospermus, I think. That's I definitely think. one that attacks bolletes, at least. Chrysospermus yeah. does. Or the bolete yeah, meter. yeah, it turns yeah. yellow eventually, but it starts out white. Actually, oh, it's that's a really covering that one. There's it a has... few other hypomyces that attack bolletes as well. I'm not sure how to tell them all apart. Depending sometimes on the host, too, there is one called transformers. Yeah, it's just a but transformed. But um, yeah, but anyways, uh, let's talk about what we're going to do then next. Uh, <laughs> that's it. That's this. I, I just thought I'll share that to you. It's such a perfect contrast, you know. Yeah, very unusual, but also very beautiful. Very beautiful picture. Yeah, I lost it the next uh, morning uh, with the lawnmower going over it, so I couldn't get it. Eh, what if... It happens. Yeah. Or maybe the that uh, specific fruiting body may have had an abundance of the type of nutrient the parasitic mushroom was desiring, so it put all of its focus on that specific section. Hmm. I don't know. Oh, cool. Well, thanks, Marius. Good joke. So, yeah, let's talk about what we want to go over next week. You guys want to hear the list of what we did last year again? Or do you just have ideas that you want to look at? We didn't do jellies last year, right? You know, I think we must have. I thought I remember doing them. I just don't have it in my... uh... I I don't think my list here is complete. I think I just have yeah, Maybe. you didn't mention them. I didn't. But I, we also did chanterelles last year. We didn't do that. Oh. You know what we could do? One, one idea. We could look at like thing, other things in Strafari ACA. We did Foliota today. We could always maybe look at the rest of the stuff. Ah, okay. That would be fun, like a follow-up and compa- mm-hmm. you know, like comparison. Yeah, because yeah. I, uh, I know... I was- I know we see a grassy and bug booty and stuff like that around. We see a bunch so of. So which around. ones? Which ones would be the next ones? The, to have the range. Well, just maybe, anything maybe. in. Strafari yeah. issue. Oh, Strafari yes, yeah. Oh, okay. That's not yeah, foliota. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. Strafari yes, yes. Strafari yes. Okay. Yeah, I have a, I have a bunch that I don't know if they're hebel, uh, hypoloma or something similar. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Sound good, Look. everyone? Look. Yeah, Marisol. Maybe I don't. Uh, this person, when we started the meeting, he asked if he could show what he found and we, we didn't oh, let yeah. him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then he disappeared. <laughs> Yeah, was that Mike? Maybe we can was... give them like 10 minutes to for two people or so, or, or promise that maybe at the end they will have a little chance and leave some time. Oh, I thought we did promise them at the end of the tonight. I remember last year when we were trying to do these focus groups, when we started sharing in the beginning, it got really confusing. And then oh. we decided that we would just limit it to like once a month okay. and do the member fines. I mean, if, yeah. if that's agreeable, that's how yeah. it was worked well last year okay i also okay. think there, there's plenty of time if if someone does want to share something i think there's plenty of time to do so either at the beginning or the end okay then well then let's all plan on reconvening next week mm -hmm. and um I will send out that list again of everything that's included in there that's uh, oh, in nice. the Safari ACA. So we'll just, uh, yeah, plan on looking at the rest of that group as a nice. follow up. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Anything else from anybody? All right. Well, let's call it a night and uh, I hope everyone have a, a wonderful week and see you next week. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good seeing you all again. Bye bye. Bye.